Kia ora koutou. Welcome to the new normal, the online hui run by Te Reo Reka o Aotearoa, New Zealand Music Commission. So glad you could join us this evening for the next hour to figure out how we're going to run gigs and go to gigs and how you're going to make a living in this new normal that we're in. Uh, joining us tonight, and they're going to quickly pop up on the screen all around me, are our speakers tonight. You'll have an opportunity to ask them questions. Joining us all the way from Melbourne is Will Evans. Uh, he is in charge of artist and label ambassadors for Bandcamp for Australia and New Zealand. So welcome, Will. So we'll start from the furthest to the closest. Uh, we also have Stuart Clumpus, who is uh, coming here as uh, someone who's run a lot of a lot of venues, big and small, uh, has done artist management, and you've looked after uh, Victor Arena, Spark, now Spark Arena, and Tuning Fork. So Stuart's going to give us a bit of a global crystal ball gaze. Uh, in the artist section, we have Chai joining us. Uh, and congratulations to Chai today, who's, who has just released another song. Wow. Uh, we will hear from her um, as well. And from the from Meow, a Wellington live venue, is uh, Ra O'Reilly. She's going to give us a perspective on what it's been like to have no gigs, to level one gigs, to maybe level two gigs, to uh, now we're almost back to normal, so we will hear from her as well. And we've also got a special performance and uh, examination or reveal into what it's like to be a live streaming musician, Emma Dilemma will be popping in about 7.30. Um, just to give you a little bit of info about myself, um, kia ora, I'm Yarina. You might sometimes hear my voice on RNZ as I'm one of the team there with Music 101. I also drive around in cars with musicians for spin-off. Uh, I love going to gigs. I love listening to music, so I'm really, really keen to hear from our speakers tonight. Uh, what we're going to do is um, each speaker is going to have about seven or eight minutes to uh, answer some questions that are quite specific to their area of expertise. Uh, then we'll have a performance um, in the middle of tonight and then hopefully some time to answer your questions from wherever you're tuning in from that you can direct to each of our speakers. Tonight we're hoping there's going to be some practical advice, some philosophical advice and just a bit of coming together of what 2020 has been like in our music community. Uh, also, to begin with that, uh, Stuart's going to speak to us first. And for each of our speakers, I'm going to ask the question, and I'm going to ask it to you as well. So please feel free to put your comment in. It's been a crazy year. But I think one thing that's kept me afloat, and maybe yourself as well, is has been music, has been live streams, new albums, just the space to listen to new music, old music. And so with that in mind, I'd like you to have a think about, and Stuart, I'm gonna put you, put this question to you first. Um, what has been your favorite music related experience, be it performance, song, recording, or activity that has kept you afloat this year in 2020? Thanks, Stuart. Well, there haven't been a humongous amount to choose from. Um, I can't really remember pre-March. We had plenty of shows and obviously a slightly different, um, you know, we all thought things would just continue, then it stopped. I guess probably LAB, simply because it was the start again at the arena. It was um, it was some it was something that almost the world was tuning into because we were the only place really doing gigs. And also because it was somebody who was a Kiwi band selling 6,000 tickets. And importantly, they didn't skimp. They really put on a great show. They, the show looked as good as any international acts. They didn't do something I think we'd be guilty of in the past. We're going, hey, this is the chance to make big money. We'll keep our production small. They, they did the business. It was, it was a great night. Really, really good. And credit to them as well. It was really, really good. crystal ball for us of of what what is the new normal going to look like um what can, what can we expect what do we need to be factoring in um we've seen a lot of live streams from big artists like bts flaming lips are performing in bubbles um we've even had benny live stream her concert over the weekend 
what what are we what are we looking at? What do we need to adapt to? Oh, these are flaming I lips. The new, I, think the new, I think the new normal yeah. is there is no normal, and that one number one we're making it up as we go, because this hasn't um, happened before. Certainly not in the life, shall we say, of rock pop music times since the fifties, if you want to call it like that. And um, I also don't think you know what's going to happen next week. And you, the the real key for me has been to be fluid and be prepared to adapt and move really quickly. And if you like, I think one of the big things that I've said to some of our teams is that we have to get into people's minds an expectation that they need to be able to move and shows could get canceled last minute and reconvened at the last minute. And I think people are going to have to adapt to not plan it or make plans, but be perfectly comfortable with them moving. You know, Kiwis haven't been particular. You know, I come from Scotland, my accent's a bit of a giveaway. And um, I've, I always found Kiwis quite good at doing stuff ad hoc. You know, in, in countries where people want to plan their life six months in advance, then they're going to have a real problem. But I think we just have to be able to move real quick. If a gig gets moved, you know, audiences need to go with it. We, we've got a little bit of educating our audience to, to be a bit flexible. Uh, what does that mean? And uh, we've got a new dimension of safety now, you know, physical distancing, of sanitizing, of contact tracing. Uh, how do we need to factor that into concerts? Because, you know, a big concert or even a small concert, you're really rubbing up next to people and, and that's yeah. part of the experience, isn't it? To be close to people and to really feel well, it. The, the con Benny concert it was very interesting and it, and it changed as well from different places in the country. I, I was at Wellington and also at Auckland and I also spoke to the guys who'd been running, girls who'd been running Christchurch in Dunedin. And when the South Island where really they haven't had the you know the same level of lockdown that Auckland has or the concern about infection, they were a lot more relaxed. Definitely on Saturday night when with the Benny Show, we built the venue a little bit bigger. It was a free flow show, which gives us basically everybody can move around the venue. They, they, they like, I really like the format. It means people can sit, people can stand, and we kind of work out from the preferences what areas we should be make, making. We made the floor bigger and we put we have made more seats available than we normally would. Yet the audience went all the way to the back. Very unusual for a, a show with a lot of young kids. And it was quite clear if you stood up at the top of the bowl and watched that people were spacing out and we put uh, opened a lot more doors and people definitely stood one step further away from each other in the queue. So yes, I think we have the, we will um, land up with people just being maybe a little bit more cautious about their their fellow humans. In terms of um, hygiene, yeah, we have to. You know, I, I never thought we ever ran a, a dirty venue per se, but we have to make it medically a little bit uh, be a bit more robust, uh, and we've done that. Uh, we also trialed on Saturday night. A little bit of a level 1.5 or a level 2 Q, upping the ante with um, temperature and a, a few other checks. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, I think there's a bit of pressure from the medical people, a lot of the people who do modelling in universities and stuff to not have mass gatherings of a certain level. But, you know, they don't really come to gigs. And one of the biggest problems we've found is trying to interface with the academics and the reality and them to understand that we actually can do things and they model things in a different way then just give us these figures like you can have a hundred people in so it's kind of safe at 99 but 101 isn't and it's all right to have 250 people in a plane or a bus but you can't have them at a gig so it's kind of you know there's a little bit of education to be done and interfacing to be done at government they need to let us in the door a little bit um, Stuart, we've got time for one more question, and what I'd really like to know is what opportunities can you see in this? Uh, you know, we're not going to have international uh, artists come and tour here for quite some time, but that also opens up a local or perhaps a trans-Tasman bubble or touring circuit. Um, what could you see there in addition to, you know, the, the safety measures you have to take in a venue? Well, it certainly meant that people who are at level X locally 
I've been able to maybe get 2x in terms of uh, audience and to be able to look at playing in the arena where they probably might not have considered it before and thought, oh, it's too big for me. And they've got a good runner. LAB is a good example. They were maybe have gone, well, I should stick with the town hall. Um, and even just Dave Dobbin, Fat Freddy's, you know, all giving it a crack. And, you know, that's really good. The, the tuning fork's been particularly busy. And uh, we've discovered that weekends is great. And we've been doing very good business. And hopefully, you know, lots of people enjoying it as well. The streaming aspect is also interesting. I don't think it is a replacement for the gig, but it's probably a good way to get yourself off to an international audience and to use it as an interface. But hey, we're open again. Um, so it's back to back to gig world. And um, yeah, the trans, you know, but it changes every week. You just got to grab the opportunity when it comes up, give it a go. And if it gets cancelled, you know, if you have to change it, shrug, build change into, build change into the future. That's what we're going to have to do. So that's a good note to, to end on, um, which is, uh, you know, be adaptable, be agile. Mm. Um, thanks so much. We'll come back to you, hopefully, for, with questions, Stuart. Uh, we're going to move over to Chai. Uh, Chai is a, has just released a new song today. You've also had your song Light Switch picked up by... Uh, the FIFA 21 soundtrack on the video game, which led you to possibly play your biggest gig in the most empty of stadiums. Um, could you tell us, could you share with us what's been your most uplifting musical moment of 2020? And we're going to watch some of your show. Yeah, I mean, it's been crazy because, you know, as you said, it's one of your biggest shows that you do, but then having to adapt has been quite interesting because we're trying to approach it creatively and and still put forward a really good show sound and visual because i keep remembering that there's still an audience um there's still a you know online audience and uh, that that will be watching it so yeah had a couple of opportunities this year which were the highlights and we had to kind of get creative with it um there was the tony hawk game um concert as well and i was like cool let's go and film that at a um, skate park and you know, do something cool with it. And that kind of kept these things exciting for me. And FIFA came up as well. And um, we were lucky enough to be able to go and film in Mount Smart Stadium because of the restrictions. There was not much going on um, at the stadium. So I guess that's another thing we can take away from all of this is, is that um, there is things that we couldn't have done before that we can kind of do now there is venues that and places that we can still use and and um have money going into those places somehow if, uh, if us artists kind of got a bit creative with it and um it's still not the same as international uh things coming through but you know i've kind of just tried to really adapt with um what we have and still try to keep the quality up. Um, I mean, I guess you'd never yeah. get to play a gig at Mount Smart, right? Yeah, it's but crazy. You played, you played one there. Um, I know, it's buzzy in front of no one. It's, it's really, it was a, it was a, it was buzzy. It was cool. <laughs> I'm wondering, Chai, as someone who's a performer, how much do you have to change how you do perform when there's no, um, audience energy like how do you generate that sense of performing is it like filming a music video but it's live right so um can you yeah. give us a bit of an insight into what that experience is like or what headspace you have to enter in as a performer it is definitely semi like a music video but then you want to have the same energy as if there's an audience there so i kind of tap into you know um early years of gigging where you have no audience i always had that mentality of bring your best performance so it was you know two of our crew members there i kind of performed to the camera as if there was people there just um, just trying to put on a, a show imagining that there's a there's a audience so that's kind of what i try to do and hopefully that energy comes through how was um lockdown for you because you're based in auckland aren't you yeah Yes. So you had that experience. I know, it was, you know, I'm in Wellington, so I have a oh, very yeah. sort of understanding of what that second lockdown was like, where people are like, 
I just felt deflated. I just didn't have energy. How did you maintain that when you had things like these concerts to do or you still had to maintain some sense of profile as an artist when you're stuck inside? It's It was quite crazy because the first time we were just about to go overseas, so it was a week from going and we went into lockdown. So it was that feeling all over again, the second lockdown. And I pretty much go into like backup mode, adapt mode. And what can I do now? What can I brainstorm in terms of um, doing content live? And, and what things that I not have time for before? when I was doing more live things that I can work on now, which would be content for live or the music um, kind of, yeah, I just went back into, I kind of got even, made myself even more busy than usual just by trying different things and seeing how, what we can do with the time we're in. So the second lockdown, I kind of, the first lockdown I would do these um, backyard live um, shows and then each time, I feel like each lockdown, there was what, like, th I can't remember, two proper lockdowns and then, like, three. But each time, I feel like my gear got better, the set got better, um, our team still worked. We worked behind the scenes on everything as if live shows were going to resume again. So, yeah, it was kind of crazy just <laughs> keeping so busy. So, Ty, if you were going to go back out, you know, when you go back out to play live or and when you tour, if you're finding venues or if you're part of a bill, when Stuart's talking about these increased measures of, um, you know, taking people's temperatures, spacing out people, um, you know, having place, the place more cleaner, who, who pays for that? How do you as an artist, one, ensure that, but two, make sure you can still make a living? Um, obviously, you know, safety first with with this new normal and um, we will just kind of do what it, we would have to do if it's if it's if there's a restriction. Um, you know, I'm all for that about the people's distancing and and, you know, using the tracer app. And um, obviously that cuts down on tickets or sales and things like that, which it just means, for me, I think of it as just doing more smaller shows. So, um, yeah, just looking at how can we create an experience that's still fun and awesome, but people are still safe and keeping a distance, um, just making the experience a bit, getting creative with the experience we create in the smaller shows and then doing more smaller shows would be the goal for me. Uh, my final question is, what has been your favourite musical moment of 2020 that you've got to participate or witness? Like, what was something you've seen that's inspired you or made you sort of cope? Um, what's crazy is that the the technology that's kind of leaped, I feel, 10 years. Um, I watched the AMAs um, with the XR technology. I don't know if you've seen the one in um, with Doja Cat performing and we have a um, exact same kind of thing happening in New Zealand, which I don't know if people are aware of. And I was involved with the um, experimenting of that. Um, so, yeah, it's very cool. And I find that technology side of it is so exciting. And XR is kind of – that's the future. I feel like the live shows are going to be – you know, live XR would be insane. Um, so what is just XR for someone who completely doesn't know what it is? Um, so uh, virtual reality kind of, but extreme reality is kind of the next, I'm not an expert in it, so I hope I'm doing it justice, but it's extreme reality. Pretty much your visual and sound and everything is real time changing with say if you're watching a concert and you move towards a drummer or move towards something, those sounds will enhance. And what this technology is doing now is being able to do that in real time, which would be a game changer in terms of uh, doing festivals even you could create you could put the whole audience in a different world kind of thing and document that and then put that back into your content um, but it's really exciting New Zealand we've got um, Optic, Sh Optic Shock, College Hill, Big Picture and a couple of other massive companies that have um, that usually do the massive international shows that come to New Zealand but they kind of saw this whole it was very inspiring seeing seeing how they came together once this happened and looked at, hey, what can we do now? And this awesome 
teamwork has come together and they're doing some crazy awesome things that is gonna that i think us as artists need to really get on board with that and yeah to get on and do it thanks chai i think that's a perfect moment to move down to will uh greetings will from all the way from melbourne you're the aston label ambassador for band camp australia and new zealand you also um, manage the band mild life go check them out and you uh run the something unlimited festival and you're a band booker for colored club so it's fair to say on all angles COVID has affected you um we'll start with your uh, we'll start with the question i've been asking everyone what's been your standout most uplifting musical experience of 2020 yeah, well, they've definitely been few and far between. Um, but uh, I, yeah, I, th I think I've been without, you know, normally I would spend a lot of time uh, with with gigs happening, listening to music um, from artists that have got shows coming up. And with that not really being a thing, I've had a little bit more time to kind of dig into some music that I might not necessarily listen to um, and a bit more money to spend on on artists that I might not have come across if I didn't have that. So I think just generally being a bit more aware of uh, recorded music being released has been really great. Um, and, yeah, I think just trying to enjoy what uh, artists have been doing in this uh, time where there's not really many rules has been good. True. Uh, now, well, I'm going to talk to you with your band camp hat on. We've talked about XR, we've talked about, um, you know, live streaming, bigger venues, but we can almost come back to basics with band camp, which if any, I'm sure everyone knows about, but I'm going to mention that it's a, you know, direct artist to fan portal, one of my favourite places to discover music, purchase music, um, find out about new music. Um, how much is... Are we going back to basics in the way where, as a music fan, I can support the artists I really like? How crucial is that, and how has Bandcamp adapted in in this new normal? Yeah, I think that um, people people connecting with artists has been a really big um, thing this year. I think people want to make that connection. People are aware that artists might be be struggling disproportionately than than normal. Um, you know, and and our um, Bandcamp Friday initiative, which is essentially us waiving our revenue share, which is our cut, um, once a month, has has been super popular, and that's kind of just those days we've been able to pass on over twenty million US dollars to artists just on those. What is it? Seven days? How many? However many months it's been? Um, and yeah, there's been almost. Uh, I think it's over a hundred million dollars has been passed on to to artists since the pandemic begun. So people know that Bandcamp is a relatively transparent and, and good place for people to purchase music from directly from artists and it'll see the majority of their money going to the artist or the independent label um, and have really kind of connected to that and, and come through for artists, which I think is really awesome at the moment. Um, using your role as the Australasian New Zealand ambassador, how important is it in this new normal for New Zealand bands and artists to use Bandcamp? Like what are the opportunities there of, say, hiring a bigger venue so expensive, of touring? You know, we've got a saturation almost of touring. As soon as we came out of level one, everyone's like, bam, October, November, all concerts every weekend. In what way can Bandcamp either um, supplement that or be another alternative for for artists to find their fans yeah i think i mean Bandcamp is a place where you're d connecting directly with with your fans um so so it's you know as with you know lots of different avenues for people to purchase and listen to music it's something that you should be focusing on um to connect in a more authentic way so i think the fact that you are talking directly to your fans using Bandcamp and selling directly to your fans um i think artists should know that and utilize that in that way so that they're you know if someone buys a t-shirt off me that's a little bit more of a connection than it's it's a similar connection to someone going to a gig because they've they've shelled out the money they've they've made the effort and it's not quite the same as hearing it on the radio or you know posting about it on the internet or you know listening to it on a streaming service it's it's a bit more 
I've got one very important question from that Bandcap angle of uh, what have you seen as being the best merch? Like the new normal, you know, bands have been making masks or hand sanitizer. What are some um, creative, or, you know, Nadia Reid has become some sort of hosiery um, baron <laughs> over lockdown, you know, with selling so many socks. Um, what can we, what, what are some um, ideas that artists could explore in terms of merch? I mean, the world is really uh, your oyster in that particular thing. Definitely some face masks. I haven't seen any hand sanitizer yet, but that's a pretty good idea. I might steal that. Um, so I think, have- think someone did some coffee. Like, I roast coffee and the cafe's closed. So now I'll sell that coffee with a particular band sticker on it or something like that. Um, but yeah, I think. You know, vinyl is, you know, without telling everyone to do something that has a very large uh, cost to actually make it, vinyl is is very, uh, very um, high selling on the site. I think since the pandemic's begun, we've sold a million, a million records um, all over the world. So if it's something that you can afford, it's still something that fans really want to buy. Um, so that would be the, the big one. And um, what's Bandcamp looking at expanding into now in this new normal? Is there anything else you can share that's on the horizon? Yeah, there's 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 something that we haven't announced that is, a, you know, it's it's a bit of a poorly kept secret at this point in that we've already done a, a few tests um, and a few performances, but we're actually um, looking to launch a live streaming platform within the site uh, in the next little while. Um, I haven't got an exact date on it, but as I said, there's already been a few test shows that have gone live and sold tickets to the public already, but it's essentially going to be a place where you can um, replace some of that lost income, hopefully with some uh, with run a high-quality ticketed live stream um, directly on your Bandcamp page. Um, your merch is going to appear alongside the stream so your fans can support uh, you during the show. Um, there'll be an optional live chat um, and you can engage with fans directly kind of in an all in an environment that you as an artist and or you as a fan are uh, familiar with in Bandcamp. Um, yeah. Can you, is there, is there any timeline to this or that's, that's still under wraps? Um, it's because we've already done a few tests, it's, it is soon. But I, uh, I, I don't want to say any uh, exact dates and then let some people down. All right, TBC. Uh, yes. Also, well, with your other hat on as a band manager, booker for a venue and festival organiser, um, what can you see in the future between Australia and New Zealand and perhaps a trans Tasman bubble? What, what kind of a advice or um announcements would you like to make to your your cousins over the side of the ditch yeah to to be honest i just i'm not i'm not sure i know that um i hope that that this this whatever this trans tasman bubble becomes does mean more um new zealand artists being able to to come over to here and i hope that a few australian bands get to go over to new zealand as well i think my gut feeling is that um every uh the local community is going to be really focused, particularly in, in Melbourne, speaking as someone from Melbourne, I think the local community is going to be really focused on on the actual local scene and repairing the local scene um, and and be less inclined to support kind of big international tours, but, but perhaps New Zealand artists don't necessarily fit into that big giant tour kind of paradigm. I'm not sure. I hope it means that there's a lot more at least um, touring that that might you know, New Zealand artists might not uh, have thought of coming to Australia and inv- thought that investing the money was appropriate. But yeah, hopefully. Uh, also, I need to just draw attention. Hopefully, Waititi, who is running this beautiful stream for us, can um, give a full shot of uh, older uh, the, the the late Eddie Van Halen on your bedroom door. So maybe <laughs> we can just have a quick look at that. It was actually noticed by some of the viewers as well. You, yeah, there he is. Yes, well, the really. new, new color printer, and you've put it to fine use. Yes. 
Uh, I'm just going to check whether we, thank you so much, Will, for joining us. Please stick around. So if there's any um, questions from our uh, audience, we can direct them to you. Uh, are we allowed to go to Emma Dilemma standing by from her live stream? There you are. Kia ora, Emma. I'm here. <laughs> Hello. I'll turn the slide off Hi. so I'm not too bright. <laughs> How's it going? Good. Uh, hey, everyone. This is Emma Dilemma who has... Have you basically pivoted into becoming a streamer over 2020? Is that what's happened? Yeah, I guess so. Like, uh, my manager was kind of encouraging me to get into streaming uh, leading up to the pandemic anyway. So then when it actually all happened, it was like, well, you know, I've been telling you to do this for a while, so now's the chance, you know. And and I hadn't started playing any of my own uh, live shows yet anyway as Emma Dilemma, so it kind of was good a good way for me to practice and rehearse playing my own music as well. <laughs> yeah, uh, I know a few people who are tuned in, and actually myself as well, I'm really keen to see how a live stream setup works. Can you give us a little yeah. bit more? I and, guess so. Um, like, and as you also, do it, can you tell me how much of a... Um, how much of a learning curve was it? <laughs> so much. Uh, so before I, before I start sharing my screen and showing what it all actually looks like, I will talk about the learning curve. I guess like at, at the same time we went into the pandemic, I also decided to take up photography as well because I had an old camera lying around and um, realised that I could do video content with that um, and use that as a camera. But then it was like, but how do you actually stream with DSLR cameras? Should I be using my phone? Should I use the webcam on my laptop? What program do I stream with? Can I stream to Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitch, uh, all these platforms all at once? I've got, I also on, face, on the Facebook side of things, I have the Emma Dilemma Facebook page. I've got my Rock Band Decades page. You know, I've got lots of friends on my personal page. My partner Moses does the live stream with me. He's got heaps of friends. So it's like, can we stream to all of our Facebook profiles at once? And so there was a massive learning curve in finding a software that kind of worked for me in terms of uh, user interface that I could understand and then going, well, that doesn't stream to multiple platforms and finding other things that have to plug into it. To, yeah. And then the first show we did, it was one camera and my webcam on my MacBook. And then I decided that wasn't good enough. And so uh, I started investing money and buying some cheaper um, cameras and some other gear to help me put overlays on the stream so we could like have whenever I do a cover of someone else's song, show their picture and their social media profiles and when me and Moses talk about stupid stuff you know can we bring up a picture of whatever we're talking about and being able to bring in people's comments so everyone else watching can see you know there's so much to learn but I think the platforms that exist out there um, are quite intuitive and so once you've kind of got a list of the gear or you know got the gear that you need to do it you can't you, you figure it out quite quickly um, there's a whole bunch of resources online and stuff that show you how to do it. Um, but I guess I should share my screen, right? And show everyone the program that I use. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm just like passing like, through this. <laughs> no, but also I really, I'd really like to know what it's like as a performer. A similar question I asked to Chai of, mm. it's a different type of performing, right? You don't have an audience. And That's the little so number weird. that tells you whether it's going up and down can be quite, um, yeah, it can really throw you. It's like, oh, God, it's yeah. going up, oh, God, I'm down. What am I doing? Um, totally. Yeah. And, and sometimes you kind of freak day. out because it might be, it might feel like relatively low numbers the whole time. Um, but what you actually don't understand is there's like, you know, heaps of people checking in and checking out, you know, 30 second bits and coming in. So usually at, when you get to the end and you see your stats, you've actually had way more people kind of tune in for a few minutes here and there than, you know, just for any given one piece of time when you feel like there might only be 50 people or 20 people or yeah. And it does throw you off, especially on a platform like Twitch um, where it, you know, it's a relatively new platform. It's built for gamers, but they're trying to get into more musicians streaming on it. And you don't 
you don't just connect with your friends on there, you know, you just stream your show <laughs> and hope that random people come across it. Maybe you've tagged it correctly or I don't know, maybe when they see it as they're scrolling past, just that one freeze frame of your show looks interesting enough for them to click in. And as soon as people come in on Twitch, you really feel a need to have to directly uh, address them. Whereas I think when we're we're live streaming to YouTube and our Facebook platform, it's more like, it's our show. We're kind of doing what we want. The people that are watching are most likely already fans or friends or family. So they're not expecting you to like kind of nurture their existence there in the show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, one more question before you give us the tour. Yes. Uh, what is it like as someone who's a musician? And I know the thing about musicians is that everyone's very particular about their sound. Things have mm. to sound good. And sometimes through the power of internet or like if you're just streaming off your computer, you don't get, you know, that crystal clear, clear beautiful sound. How have you um, either mitigated that or coped with the fact that it's just going to sound a little bit beep? <laughs> well, I guess that's part of the like, like I briefly mentioned earlier, you know, finding out what kind of lists of gear that you can afford and works for the streaming. So like I have this really small like two channel interface. It's called a Scarlet. Focus right Scarlet 2i2 and like for our first kind of few streams I was just chucking a vocal microphone into one channel um like a little condenser mic or sometimes just like an SM57 like a live kind of microphone um and just my acoustic guitar and that obviously makes the sound way better than just playing live to your laptop microphone or your phone microphone um, but since then, since we're, I think tonight's like our 22nd show and we do them one every Tuesday, um, every Tuesday night. So we've been going for <laughs> half a year, basically, um, over the course like of that time. Could you think of it as band great. practice? Like is it yeah, taken yeah. over band practice? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and But now that we've kind of done a few shows and we're building a following, you know, some of our friends who are audio engineers and stuff uh, have reached out to us. So my friend Alex Harmer, he now comes around every Tuesday and he brings this big, you know, 16 channel mixer or whatever it is. And then that talks to my interface that's on the screen right now. And, and he can actually live mix stuff and add reverb and actually make it sound more like a show and that I don't have to toggle reverb and stuff on and off. What, when I go from talking to singing, he kind of just, you know, he can hear everything and he's live mixing it, which is awesome. So <laughs> he's so a much. In the classic New Zealand community way, you still got to pull favours, is what oh, you Oh, absolutely. Saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We do actually, we started having sponsors. So um, the companies that sponsor us, like, for our weekly shows, they just basically pay for booze and food for for the show. And so they oh, feed and oh, beverage yeah. us and everyone who hangs out with us every week. We can have, like, we have studio, mem like, audience members in my living room and stuff some weeks, like, our friend Brenny, who's here tonight, he comes around most weeks and my sister comes around sometimes and she helps us and stuff. Last week we had like quite a few people around. I think we've had like maximum about eight people in here at once watching it live in the room, which is quite a feat because my house is about this big. So it, it can get quite packed. Um, and hopefully I might I be able to show tour. you. Have we done the tour of your setup? Because I can't yeah, leave it without seeing. Let's do that. Um, yeah. Let's go across to here. I think... Are we sharing my screen? Whoop, 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 whoop. Can you see this? Technology. Yes, I, I can see it. I can't tell because now I'm only looking at this program. So that's why it looks like I'm not looking at the camera, but I'm looking at my laptop. So this is the program I use on MacBook. Uh, it's purposely built just for uh, Apple products. So if you're on a PC, yeah, I, don't, I don't know what you use, but I like this. It's called Ecamm Live, um, which you can see up in the top left corner, I think. Um, and I like this platform for streaming or this program for streaming uh, rather because to me it's kind of like the Apple equivalent of programs where everything is super user-friendly. Like you got your comment section, you got your overlays over here. You can just, it just, you just click it and it pops up if I can get it. Um, and you load in your overlays just, you know, using these buttons down here and then you can turn them on and off using these eyeballs. <laughs> <laughs> um, have you invested in lighting as well like um do you mind t telling me how much you've invested in terms of gear and kit it looks like a very nice light you've got there is it a ring light it's Ooh. this 
No, I got this. These lights. I've got two of them. I got them from the warehouse. They're just um, LED, like they're house lamps basically. But because they're LED, they give that really crisp, awesome studio lighting. So they're like fifty bucks each. Um, we got those probably like five or ten shows in when we realized that our lighting was really bad. Um, I had to invest in one of these guys. I didn't have to, but I wanted to. So before when I was using the screen to kind of toggle on and off overlays, um, that's what this guy does. So Moses usually sits in this seat and he has this here and, and he pushes the buttons that toggle the overlays on and off and can also toggle between cameras. I could show but you, but I think it's... Like like cut to other cameras. I was wondering when I was watching your live yeah. stream, I had no professional lighting. Clearly. Yes, so oh, this, yeah. this cuts between cameras and, you know, turns overlays on and off. And I wish I could show you right now, but I think because I have this this hooey going and my program going, it's having a meltdown and doesn't want to play ball. But I can use my laptop to change. So we've got two cameras going. That's my intro thing, sorry. That looks like some really mind. pro graphic, graphic design. <laughs> it's super good. I wrote that with my left hand and took a photo of it and then scanned it in. We're going to crowdsource you a new, a new title screen if you want. Well, yeah. I'm a graphic designer, so I actually have no excuse. I should have a better one, but um, I do not. So, yeah, I've got these two cameras. Uh, hang on. Sorry, I'm freaking out here. These cameras. So that's I'm usually sitting over there. Um, so that's live right now. And then, yeah, so you can toggle kind of between the two. So I usually sit over there. Moses sits here. So you've got two and, cameras. One yeah, we've got two. Before. Yeah, and I, we do want to have like a um, a room camera as well. So when people are, you know, in the audience, we could be panning and, and showing kind of their interactions as well. But we haven't quite got enough money to get a third camera for that yet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's kind of how that program all is set up and working and stuff um I'll turn this light off it's way too bright for my laptop and um, so and an audience in a live stream setting are probably a lot more forgiving for technical difficulties for not knowing how to work your gear that kind of oh yeah thing. yeah definitely and i think that's part of it because with a live stream it's a lot different from a live you know show at a venue where you actually are just talking most of the time for us anyway, because our, our live stream is like a variety show kind of chat show and we play music as well. It's not, here's our concert that we're putting on the internet and we're going to play for 40 minutes or whatever. Um, we do do that sometimes as well, but not on our Tuesday shows. Um, so it's a, yeah, a lot more of a focus on crowd interaction and if the production values kind of have a meltdown, you know, if a camera dies or, the overlays don't work or a microphone freaks out. The other week, actually, we had a synth, like a drum machine synth thing happening and a microphone rolled off the table and landed on that. And so then everyone was blasted with this weird beat. <laughs> Just stuff like that. I think that's kind of the, the element of surprise and delight that appeals to people who want to tune in and watch these shows because it's pure chaos and they have a chance to actually kind of influence how the show runs and, yeah. And you get hopefully, to this music at the same time. Hopefully, we're going to put a link into your stream in our comment yeah. section. Right, I will, yeah, yeah, I can. Um, yeah, we go live tonight at eight thirty, so I'll put yeah, I'll put so, one of the one of the admin team a link and yeah, yeah. And so we yeah. should be well wrapped up by then. But you're going to give us a little taste, aren't you? A little bit of a performance before you get ready. Should for I? Should I could? I would have to do it. How would I do this? I'd have to. Yeah, so over there in front of my camera, I'd have to share the screen again, I guess, and we could try that. So I wouldn't be able so to fun. hear you, though. I wouldn't be able to hear you, so this would oh, be... That's fine. You, just, you, just, you just do your thing and just be like, I'm done, and then I can move on to our final speaker. All right, I'll run back over here. All right, I'll, I'll, All right. Do, I'll do a little bit. Alex, you Should can... I just fill while you do that? Yeah, you do a fill, and uh, <laughs> I'll go back to sharing my screen and okay. figuring this out. Um, okay. Let's have a look. Do do. Oh gosh. All right. Uh, no, Rodney, don't send it to me. Um, I'm getting <laughs> Rodney with our admin who sent me the link to Emma's um, Emma's live stream. But if you just go Emma Dilemma 5000 after you've watched the new normal, then you can check out the the variety show coming from her, her lounge. Oh, there it goes. Thank you, Rodney. 
Um, Hopefully everyone can see and hear me. You could go check. I can't tell if everyone can. <laughs> I'm just going to interrupt everyone talking right now because I can't tell. Alex right, is jumping just checking on. that you can hear me. Just let me know. I think I heard some noise of, of, of affirmation. All right, yes. All right. Cool. Okay. I'll go in then. Uh, this is just part of one of my songs called Vulnerability. It goes like this. <laughs> no, I've turned the guitar wrong. There you go. Livestream chaos. <laughs> I'm doing fine. I wanna wake in the world. It might leave a scar. I'm on a way down, and I can hear the voice saying that you are not worth love. And on this day, I can feel the tension coming up. Vulnerability sat there right in front of me Said there are no guarantees I can tell you what to do Let me just take my hand This is life got buried then Look your ego and I Time to change your point of view You're not pretty enough You're not pretty enough You're not worthy enough but Baby, I had enough I'm not ever across I'm my faults I'll take blame, I'll take shame Quit the game and give name to the truth I'll finish there. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, Emma. <laughs> thank you so much. Oh, she's running back. Uh, I think there was a question about um, Emma's switcher. I believe it was the Scarlet, I think, that she uses. Oh, for I will actually the... say, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can. Cool. Can you just tell me My... what the switcher? We've had a question um, who, um, from one of our audience about the oh. It's called an Elgato Stream Deck, and you can get them in this 15 button configuration, or I think there's one that's like 40. But, um, I think don't don't get the 41 because with this you can have up to 12 profiles and you can have buttons that switch between profiles so you can have limitless amounts of things that you can do on it anyway. It's about 200 bucks I think. I feel like you can almost go really meta and have a live stream just about how to live stream. Oh, I think people actually do do that. Like oh, Ecamm, yeah, the program that I use, they quite often live stream about how to live stream. I need that off, yeah. Yeah. So, hey, Emma, I'm going to let you go because we're going to hear from Thank our you. last people. We're going to go from the live stream space back into the old live venue space. So awesome. thank you so much. All the way from Have a good night tonight. You too. And if anyone does want to ask me any questions privately, you can always just Facebook message me. I will answer any question. <laughs> Hit me. All right. Invite uh, Ra O'Reilly, who is one of the co owners and managers of awesome people that run that's a good sentence um, the venue in Whanganui Atara, Wellington, which is Meow. Uh, Meow has come back roaring. These, but you've had shows that um, I think of Ingrid and the Ministers. I think that was the third time lucky that she finally got to have her album release show that was meant to happen in February or something or April. I don't yeah. know what month it was. And no, then you've had yeah. Jess B completely pop off, right, the other week in Meow. Um, quick question, how has um, 2020, what's been your uh, memorable musical moment? Can I do two? Yes. Um, for me, one of the greatest things, because as a venue we're as much about the audience as the musicians, it's just that sheer joy of the audience to be back at a show when we came out of that first lockdown. And that, it was amazing. And it just drove home how important it is, how important it is for the musicians to be doing these live shows and to be a venue and what we give to people. 
and that coming together to enjoy. And that was amazing and really strong, that feeling. Um, the other thing is that sort of with the lockdown and having a bit more time, Meow Records has got its first release coming out on Friday, which is really exciting. Oh, that's exciting. There's a Tuesday and their first single is coming out. So that's been a nice progression to come out of this year. So that I guess that wouldn't have would they have happened if it, if it were not for this new normal? Was that always something on the cards? Uh and oh no! Because sorry, we lost you there for a minute. So oh. yeah, am I back? Yes, you're back. So um, I didn't get to hear the start of your answer there. Um, it probably would have happened eventually, but we had a bit more time, and because couldn't tour, and so um, Damien's very project driven. So yeah, yeah. Um, we've got a couple of really specific questions to venues one is with having to accommodate a safer space like there's been always a talk of safer spaces before covid right of making mm. a place free or you know free of harassment or any um you know or people just misbehaving um but also now we've got the added component of hygiene and safety from a kind of viral health public health point of view what kind of pressure does that put on venues and who where does the buck stop for those extra costs how's that spread um so with the when there's limited capacity that cost is absorbed by the venue and by the artists because they can't sell as many tickets um as a hospitality business it I mean, legally, we have to run a hygienic thing, but it did get ramped up, of course. Um, for us, we have the privilege of having been around a while and we were able to kind of absorb some of those costs that I think it was much harder for new businesses where you have greater debt. Yeah. And what have been the top three things that you've had to make a priority in this new normal? You know, one, there was the, the time where the entire country went into lockdown. Then we had that time where it was almost like spring, where we all sort of re-emerged and there were just concerts every weekend, almost an oversupply. Um, and then all of a sudden everything sort of pulled back again. What were the... Um, what are the three main things that, as an audience member or as a um, touring artist, uh, you would like to share with us that we can take away? I think we use to adapting and doing stuff on the fly. And we're also very aware that we're part of a community. And the biggest thing is that we all work together and that we have patience and that we're willing to be adaptable, but we can do that. And that's what we always did before. It's just intensified now. Um, and I also think that we just have to keep moving, that we can't give up. It's probably the biggest thing. It's two, I don't know what a third would be. Um, is it that uh, audiences are more reluctant to buy tickets in advance now that there's that uncertainty? Like, how do you, as a venue for touring artists, um, broach that? Um, yeah, it's always a marginal operation at the best of times, but now it's, you know, getting a little freakier. Um, after the first lockdown, things sold out so quickly um after the second one now there is a reluctance to buy tickets until people are sure that the show is going to go ahead and i can understand that um i think for touring artists you just have to be confident in your product and so what we are seeing now is that things sell out on the day because people know they can go and yeah just be confident in your product and keep going because there's such a huge hunger to go to shows still is what we hear from people. 
Um, what about um, what are the we've talked about extra costs of like making safe a venue. Um, what other things do you think people, what is it that you have to make safe for artists as well as audiences now more than ever? Is it making it more tricky? Um, yeah, uh, level two is incredibly hard as a venue and it's, I mean, I've talked to other venue owners and it, there is this soul destroyingness of it that the smaller audiences and the greater staff um, for the artists um, with our first shows I like Jess B I think so Auckland was still in two and Wellington was one so we had to keep the artists separate from the crowd that they couldn't go out and right yeah Sorry, I missed the last but bit they, of that. We were saying that you had to keep GSB separated from level one. So, yeah, I'm, the rest of that. So, because Auckland was still in level two, so they weren't, if you were from Auckland, you couldn't be in a crowd of more than 100. And so they had to stay restricted to the green room or on stage as opposed to go out amongst the crowd. Um, but that's okay. We, I mean, we can do that. Yeah. Um, shall we open it up for questions for everyone? So I'd like to welcome all our speakers back. Maybe about seven minutes over time. So we might finish about seven minutes past eight, or maybe if people don't mind, we can go to 10 past eight. Um, welcome back, Stuart, Will, and Chai. Um, a question for the panel is, um, audiences are shy to commit to buying tickets after so many show cancellations and postponements this year. What are your thoughts on reassuring people about buying tickets um, to in-person gigs more than a few days in advance of show dates? They should just commit. <laughs> it's a good cause. Did you guys hear my question? Yes. Yeah, I can come. Should people well, should people be committing to tickets before show day? Yes. Well, um, the experience in Auckland's been a little bit different. The Tuning Fox been sell, selling out and selling out early. I think again, it's a it's a question. You know, if if, if people want to six thousand more twelve thousand people want to see Benny, it will go six thousand tickets will go in a day. I don't think it's it's not been hugely different. People who who sell tickets sell tickets. Um, but there probably is a little bit, I would say, probably after the hardcore, I mean, we're getting into the sort of the less committed people, um, they probably don't. But the flip side is there's a lot of people who are probably a little bit bored and they've got nothing, you know, there's not an awful lot else. Um, there's not so much competition anymore. So I think it's probably swings and roundabouts. But we're not seeing a drop off in commitment to people to buy international shows that are on sale absolutely and so you should be with a closed border but not from local acts definitely not um Stuart maybe this is a question again for you and, to, and I did ask it of Ra of when you are spacing people out when there's a need to make venues um safer for public health measures um who bears who bears the cost of that like who will be eventually paying for these live stream setups or hybrid gigs as well there isn't a cost because we've not been there yet. You know, the, the, the bottom line is we've not been able to open. So, you know, you can't open Spark Arena to 100 people. You know, that's the, so you can't do that. You can't really, we can do comedy in the tuning fork. And could we open to 100 people and make it work? Yeah, maybe 100 people seated. There's, there's no extra cost. In fact, the costs of the venue are actually less. But Rahini hit it on the nail on the head. It's not a cost. It's an income problem. If you if somebody is capable of selling four hundred tickets and can only sell a and you're only allowed to sell a hundred, then your um, income starts to match the hundred. And if you've only got a hundred tickets and the the um, the proceeds from that, then the costs have to match the hundred. There is a point where it becomes too few to cover the costs, 
and it varies in venues, you know. Um, I'm not sure what the tuning fork is. Uh, maybe 100, maybe it's 200 before you, you get into things. But 100 people certainly doesn't cost open, you know, cover the cost for opening Spark Arena, that's for sure. Will we see more uh, gigs in the provinces is another question we received from the audience. Well, I can tell you that from a touring perspective, from knowing what the rest of the Live Nation camp are up to, the answer is absolutely. Because, you know, if you're not going to be able to go to Australia or go to the USA, then you're, you know, you've got to you're restricted to your um, home country, then why not go play everywhere? I mean, I'd actually like to see, I mean, I won't get into this now, but um, on a personal level, and going back to a lot of the things we used to do in Scotland with some of the bigger bands, they used to be really keen to go and do Highlands and Islands tours and go play small venues in Sky and Stornoway, which would be the equivalent of going to play Westport and... Um, and, and places like that, you know, uh, and uh, uh, Foxton and Graham even, you know, that that kind of thing. And we haven't really seen that yet. And I'm a little bit disappointed that some of the uh, larger acts, it would have been really nice to see them maybe do a 30-day tour in New Zealand. I mean, would that not be a statement? And you can read between the lines of people who can really carry large numbers saying, hey, we're going to go out, we're going to play everywhere. You know, I would love to have seen something like that, but I can't call that. I can only make some personal suggestions. Just get back in a high ace and away you go. Well, be a bit more from some of the bigger ones, a high ace might be a circus tent, but nonetheless. <laughs> but I think I think nonetheless, you you know, you, you should go out there because there's people aren't buying tickets for Taylor Swift. People aren't buying tickets for um you know cold play or or whoever it might be, or, you know, um, uh, I can't think off the top of my head. You know, The weekend, Drake, yada, yada, yada. So if you're into music, then, you know, why not go see somebody local? But again, you have to have the ability to be able to, to, um, to get people to come and see you. You know, somebody likes Drake, maybe not going to come and see Wax Mustang, even though they might well enjoy it, but maybe they will. And actually, Max was, Max, Wax, Wax Mustang is sold particularly well. So maybe people who would go and see Drake are going to see them. Or the guys who were on at um, you know, the other week, Bahini, when we were down, who were the um, church and... Church and AP. Church and AP. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Great, you know. Yeah, who have actually gone and toured small, small town New Zealand last summer. So um, yeah. speaking of touring... Um, one question for Chai. Are you going to be supporting your new single with a tour? Is there any any chance of you hitting the road anytime soon? Definitely. So I'm 100% keen to do a lot of shows, small towns all across New Zealand, um, which, yeah, it's in the in the process at the moment. But um, so we've got the hopefully, fingers crossed, summer festivals that are coming up um, as well. So we're just getting ready for those. But um I'm thinking early next year, so yeah. It's um, exciting. I, I think we've got time for one more question, and um, and I'll leave you all if you, um, and I'll leave you all to have any closing statements if you'd like to share with our audience this evening. Um, well, uh, so I'll start with uh, Ra, and I'll move around to Chai, then Stuart, then Will. Um, as people in the music community as artists, venues, um, label runners and so forth, managers. How can uh, people in the music media, photographers, reviewers, webzines, uh, help what you're doing in this new normal beyond the existing promotion? What, what can we, what can the music media do as part of the new normal to support all of you? Um, as a venue, I think it was amazing what the music media did in reminding people that they needed to use us or else they were going to lose us. And um, everyone knows that, but that reminder, I think, was very good for venues in New Zealand. And that was thanks to the music media in a large part. Uh, Char? Um, yeah, so media would be great, like, um, 
if there's like more promotion around shows and like you said tying in kind of releases and you know obviously we get a lot of press around that and maybe somehow tying those things into each other with live shows and um yeah just promoing <laughs> yeah Stuart um I think the media has actually got quite a significant role to play and I don't think it's helped us at all it'll be nice and controversial um the media tends to quote a lot of experts who tell us that only 100 people are safe in a venue. I think there's a lot of experts in the music and entertainment business who don't get a, a fair back at this. And um, the, the media has been very good at, at being focusing completely on health experts. Um, and I mean by health, I mean health care experts. And I think that we have tended to be sidelined and then to be seen as a frivolous afterthought and the entertainment, music, art is an afterthought and not important. And it's more important to get people to travel to Queenstown for the tourist business than to get people to come to shows and to go to art exhibitions and so on and so forth. And I'd like to see the media really get uh, a little bit behind um, giving us our place as part of um, well-being and mental health and uh, it not being completely dominated by people who are professional health care people or health care academics we need a bit of a better balance okay I, I think that's probably something in the medium term that is a, a new normal that we can have that conversation will anything from uh, across the tasman yeah i think that um the music media can just put a, a lot more emphasis on on reminding everybody that you know this this scene that doesn't matter what city you're in or what country in this this scene is something that we've built and and it goes away if we don't remember that and it and if you like going as Stuart's saying if you like going to Drake concerts or, or whatever you know that that doesn't come back if the if the the local stuff isn't supported so you know when everything's we're you know talking from stage four lockdown in in Victoria there hasn't been a restaurant or a bar or a venue open for several months um you know uh, everybody just needs to support those scenes um and go to local gigs doesn't matter how big or small they are when they come back because we need to support everyone venues sound engineers promoters you know artists most importantly but um everybody needs that uh, I think that will that that's a really great note to end on, which is a new normal still needs all of us to be part of that community and that ecosystem. Um, but I thank you so much for um, giving us your time this evening. Chai, also thank you so much for sharing your um, 2020 experiences with us and uh, all the best with the XR stuff. That sounds really exciting. And, and Stuart, thank you for sharing your wisdom and putting a challenge out there, a whittle to our media and to how um, our experts are framing what the new normal is. And Will, thank you so much for sharing the exciting uh, developments over at Bandcamp and hope everything settles down and gets safe over in Victoria. Uh, to Wairere and Rodney, who've been our behind the scenes admin, thank you so much. And for everyone tuning in, thank you so much for giving your time this evening to help us figure out the new normal. Don't forget to head to Emma Dilemma's stream. It's kicking off in about 21 minutes. So that's over at there, 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 there. There. Um, keep safe, keep well. Uh, have a lovely evening. I'm Yarana Saw. Poor Marie.